We got th we got three uh, three red lights, buddy. We got three red lights. Which which camera should we look at? <laughs> <laughs> let's go straight. Let's just go straight ahead. Sure. Uh, guys, welcome. The very first Viper Pro live feed. We're on three accounts right now. Uh, we're on my personal uh, Instagram account, which yeah, is going to be over, over here. Now. That's right. Uh, we're on Michelle's personal Facebook, which is over here. And then we have the Viper Pro page, which is right in front of us. And so uh, on behalf of Viper Pro, my name is Derek Price. I'm the Director of, Edu uh, Director of Education with IOM as well as with Viper Pro. And sitting beside me is Michelle Dalcourt, the uh, founder of IOM as well as the creator of Viper and Viper Pro. I uh, want to welcome you. We're going to be uh, discussing uh, kind of some of the, the training principles behind Viper, why it was created, what purpose does it serve. Uh, we'll also get into the latest design of Viper, which we, which we have, which is Viper Pro. We'll be talking about uh, the many changes that we have behind the, the, the product itself. And then we'll also get into some of the uh, education pieces that we have, as well as our frequently asked questions that are out there. I'm, I'm laughing because I'm a rookie when it comes to social media, so I don't even know if this is going out to anybody right now. <laughs> That's right. It's, are we doing this right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm sure. I hope so. Uh, but yeah, thank, thanks for that, um, you know, DP. And, and uh, you know, I think this is uh, kind of a long time in coming. Um, you know, we, we're really excited about the redesign uh, of the, the product, but we also want to create a, a narrative. We often have talked about this, right? We want to create an authentic, substantive, and respectful narrative on, you know, why train this way. And it doesn't just include this tool, it's why train this way with, you know, variability, why train this way with, which is, you know, varying degrees of, uh, of intensities. Uh, and so that kind of harkens back to a discussion that, that you had with me, with our team, probably about three or four months ago. When we, dis when we were talking about this particular product and, and really what authentically it anchors into. And one of the things that we kept coming back to was this idea of resiliency mm. and performance. And, um, and we talked about how a lot of periodized approach to training themselves are not sustainable through the course of a lifetime. That's right. And, um, and so maybe you know, we can discuss that to start is really what's our identity? with this and uh, and why would why would that matter to people yeah definitely uh as we get into that if you guys have questions as we go through this do us a favor go to our viper pro facebook page like us on there ask us questions on that particular page because uh, we'll be checking that throughout and then we can address those questions at the end do they just pop up there they will they just pop up right there okay so for example scotty mitchell has joined what's up scotty mitch oh cool Gigi's on board trevor's on board cool uh so it's it's pretty cool that we can see everybody on there awesome uh so with this idea of resiliency how would you define resiliency Michelle? well i mean when we think about the parameters of biology resiliency is something that biology can sustain and sustain itself for a long period of time so to be resilient means to to kind of bend without breaking mm. um and yielding to stressors uh, fundamentally, biologically, are important because that's how adaptations occur. There is a breakdown, there's a disruption uh, in physiology, uh, and then the body adapts to either remodel or reconstitute itself so it can get stronger. Yeah. So this idea of bending without breaking is really, uh, you know, we hear often hear that in sport, right? The defense that can bend without breaking is a good defense, right? And I think that that kind of, you know, euphemism almost can apply to biology as well. Yeah. Uh, which is we need to accommodate a body that can bend without breaking. And, you know, we see a lot of broken bodies uh, in, in our field. Right. Well, and so let's address that. So what in, what's currently being done or has been done that has kind of given us a different perspective of how we can promote resiliency within training? Because it, it, we might be able to look at certain parameters around training right now in the strength and conditioning world and say, well, that might enhance performance, but at a detriment to the health of the athlete, long-term especially. Yeah, when we think about research, and I was talking to Guido about this yesterday, um, we often look at an athletic performance outcome. And research, if we're researching an athletic performance outcome, is anchored into that. So we want to see a, a, an advantage um, or a, a, an improvement in performance outcomes. And so, you know, we look at that. Let's say we take a javelin thrower. Right, and I practice throwing a javelin. Because of that endeavor, uh, I need to have a tight side. 
and I need to have a more limber side. So to be an effective thrower in that capacity, I actually have to be asymmetrical mm -hmm. by design. Yeah. And that's going to accommodate a better performance outcome. And so I need to post up and anchor into my stronger, kind of less flexible side. And then I need to, let's say if I'm a right-hander, I need to accommodate more of an elastic potential stretch on my loose side, we'll call it. And then the combination of tight and anchored yeah. and loose and limber and stretchable can accommodate a nice force potentiation and then uh, an exertion of force. Like a whip. Yeah. And I take advantage of muscular output. I take advantage of the stretch reflex. I take advantage of that because I have a, a, a strong side, a stable side, a rigid side, if yeah. you will, and then a limber side. And that's great. But if through the course of my athletic career, I don't clean that up at some point in time, that will lead to its own detriment in time. So I have promoted performance yes, sir. in my 20s and 30s, and I've you know, got to the podium and won my gold medals. And then as my 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s ensue, now I've got to manage this asymmetry, which is going to disrupt joint mechanics. Uh, it may overload certain tissues. Uh, it may disrupt normal rhythm so that I can mitigate stress because it localizes stress because I'm too rigid at that point. So that's kind of where my mind goes to in terms of what we can look at when we think about the idea of performance without resiliency and sustainability. I've got outcomes in my 20s and 30s that cannot be sustained through my 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. You got me thinking not just 40s, 50s, 60s, but it's happening in our youth right now. Sure. The over-specialization happening in youth sports, you see it when they reach their early 20s, they're already having the, the major surgeries breakdown within the body. Um, and so th to think that this is not just an old person issue, this is a human being issue when you start talking about the balance of performance and health. Mm -hmm. And so re resilient training, right, to promote resiliency within the body needs to factor in not only to be able to perform well, but are we creating sustainable health outcomes to allow for a sustainable athlete to, to go forward? And that was the thought process behind the genesis of the first iteration of Viper, right? You took a look at farm kids, and we've told this story before. You take a look at farm kids. They have a large degree of variability in their approaches to load training, yeah. right? Uh, we'll call that lower load but high degrees of you know of variability or more degrees of freedom. Yes, sir. And then the gym kid has increased load with less degrees of freedom. And they both have positive outcomes that are necessary. And I think the conversation shouldn't be binary. It shouldn't be one versus the other. Right. It really needs to be both. And uh, to effectuate you know, the, the outcomes that we're looking for, we need to consider both. And you know, kind of what we wanted to do is bring the outside loading parameters into the gym scenario with the first iteration of Viper. With the relaunch of Viper Pro, it reflects more of a change in design of the tool. And maybe that's something we can go through right now. Yeah, well, I think it's a lot of lessons learned, right? Sure. A lot of lessons learned and uh, a lot of great feedback from the community. And through that, the the manufacturing now of, of a more enhanced product um, that in itself, the tool is resilient in and of itself, let alone in a way to use it to promote resiliency with us. Yeah. And so as we profile, you know, the new features, which we're going to show you right, right now uh, of the Viper Pro, you know, I, I think we can't start this conversation without a huge shout out to uh, both Jay and Claude, uh, who themselves are both fitness enthusiasts. Jay's kind of tilting a little bit more towards the internal aspects of fitness as well. But my father, Claude, certainly, a, you know, a fitness enthusiast, didn't know the inner workings of the fitness industry, but both have engineering minds and both did a phenomenal job of getting a product that is you know, every bit what we wanted and perhaps even more. Yeah. Uh, so a huge thanks to them. Uh, so here we've got, you know, a, a 6K. And we're going to start kind of just spitting out some of the features uh, that it has. Now, as, the first thing you're going to notice is that all of them are going to be black. And what we're going to come back to is the idea that it reflects a professional grade, right? So, you know, this is a professional grade tool. Uh, and we're going to show features of it, and we're going to kind of test it out in front of you right now. But, you know, the all black is going to be the aesthetic that kind of leads with the substance of this uh, in order for us to say, hey, listen, this is Viper Pro, and it is professional grade. 
So all black, um, and what distinguishes the weights now are gonna be the color bands. So the 6K, which we're holding right now, has a, um, a gray band to it. And I don't know if you guys can see this here, but the numbers right here are you know, pretty significant oh, wow. in terms of, and they're on both sides, right? So they're pretty large. And uh, what allows that to be is an easy visual uh, of the weights itself, right? We're getting a flag from, you can, you can see it, Jay. Oh, just the logo. Oh, the logo. Just gotta get the logo in. Can I get the logo? Nice. Yeah. So a couple things. Aesthetically, easy to see the weights, the band and the large numbers. And then the, the logo themselves is one on the, we're gonna call this the front, the double uh, handle side. And then on the back, we've got two logos that are raised. I guess when we're talking about the logos, one of the things that we wanted is a customizable feature. Yeah. So this center logo, can you guys see that it's raised off the body of the Viper? I don't know if that's you can catch that. That's a raised about, what is it, Jay? Three millimeters? Three millimeters. Yeah. So that's raised up. And that one there is actually, um, like the other ones, are inserts into the mold. And if you wanted to create a customizable uh, interface, you can actually take an insert put your logo on it, we put that insert into the cavity and we actually run Vipers out so that your logo is not just glued on, it's actually embedded in the Viper itself and it would be raised the same three millimeters or so. And so that becomes a customizable feature, which we're really excited about because it doesn't add to the utility, but it certainly um, identifies an aesthetic and a branding component that, um, you know, that adds to our community too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the, the next component that we can look at here next to the logo, if you guys can see, there is now this texture that's wrapped around the Viper, the Viper Pro. And this texture is slightly raised and it, it adds to the grip and stability when we are grabbing it on end. Now, can you imagine, like for those that have used Viper in the past, uh, when we're picking it up in this manner, we're swinging it around, our hands get uh, sweaty, they get wet, and it becomes really hard to grip. And so we added this texture piece to create a more stable uh, per, uh, component to the Viper Pro. So that way it allows us to, to be able to do more things with it now without worrying that we're gonna, it's going to slip, it's going to fly somewhere, right. um, something to that manner. So I, that, that to me, uh, you know, I love the fact that we have it wrapped around now. We were going back and forth about where it would be placed and uh, it, it's awesome to have it everywhere because that just gives me now infinite places to where I can start to grab and manipulate this. I don't have very big hands, but I feel that uh, I, I need as much advantage as I can get with my small hands to be able to grab all this. So uh, I really appreciate that aspect. And that also, it's not for only elite athletics. It's, you know, for the general population and even the older adult yeah. that needs a little bit more interface and a little bit more security yeah. uh, as they interact with this tool. Now, remember, because it's more professional grade, we're going to do some different things with it. That's right. And uh, this is going to come in real handy. Um, and we're really pleased on the aesthetic and also the functionality of, of, the, uh, of the texture. Uh, so you can probably hopefully see that on the cameras. Um, How about these handles? Okay, so... Honestly, truthfully, to the community, you know, obviously the handles were a little bit of an issue, and uh, for for a couple of reasons. First, they uh, sometimes they you know they didn't feel quite right. Yeah. They, they weren't kind of the rounded handles that we were used to when we grabbed a barbell or dumbbell. Right. Uh, what we did, I don't know if you guys can catch this, but they're raised. They're actually raised. This one's probably a little bit easier to see. You can kind of track the body of, of, of the Viper itself and then it raises the Viper Pro. It raises up and then it comes back down. So the handles on the Viper Pro accommodate what's, what are called greater uh, uh, radiuses. So they are more rounded. And so when I grip it, it reflects more of a grip that I might feel when I grip a barbell or a dumbbell, something that I'm used to. Yeah. And that is easier on the hands. By raising it, you also create more of a robust handle within the Viper Pro. What does that allow us to do? Well, I'm about, I don't know how much I weigh now, but if I put my entire body weight on it, what, what you're going to see is that it doesn't flex very much. It'll give a little bit, but it doesn't flex very much. And that's a good thing because what we don't want is we don't want any type of disruption to the handle when we're engaging in dynamic patterns if we're going to engage in that. You said resiliency. 
can be defined as bending without breaking. Yeah. That was there you go. That was a perfect perfect example. And uh, we've actually got video of uh, so Quill when he went out to uh, to um, Taiwan where we manufacture these. Uh, we actually put the the product on the ground. Uh, we put a die uh, over top of it and loaded it onto it. And uh, that was a, a four metric ton die. Yeah. And it basically squashed us like a pancake. And then when we lifted it off, uh, you know, it wasn't split. The handles were fine, so we've got really good degrees of confidence that you know this this product is going to stand up to the rigor associated with you know movement based resistance training. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so the handles were really we're happy about, and we needed to get that right. And I think Jay and Claude really got that right for us. So, how about the ends? Uh, another thing you're going to notice is you know these flared ends right here, and as you could well imagine, if I place this on end on the ground. Because now there's a greater profile on the ground, it's got a lot more stability when on end. That's right. And so if I'm just standing up like this and it tilts a little bit, it's going to catch itself. It still allows me to tilt it just fine, right? But it's going to catch itself and be a lot more, you know, kind of um, sure into the ground, so to speak. The other one is when we're gripping it in a, a wide hold, my hand can accommodate in it a nice interface with this ridged end. And you know what, I gotta be real honest, the more I use this, and the more I grip it wide, the more I like it. Yeah. Because it accommodates the wrist a little bit more. So when we're doing some dynamic loading patterns, yeah, it, it just feels, it feels really good. Yeah. And it has, let's be honest, it has a nice aesthetic to it too. That's right. It looks a little bit more, you know, kind of that, that, that hungry kind of quality to it, right? That yeah, sports car quality to it. So uh, it looks good too. And um, yeah, so those ends are the flared ends, which is another great feature for us. We can talk about the weight profiles. Too. That's right. So not only are the weight insignias larger, and then they're identified with a different color band for each, but uh, the weights go from 4K, 6K, and 8K. We're going to call those the smaller dimension vipers, and they reflect uh, this size, which is, if you're used to the, the, the first generation viper tools, that's the same size as the 6. That's right. right? So the 4, 6, and 8 are going to be these smaller dimensions. In kilograms. In kilos, yeah. And then the 10, if you're familiar with that, with Viper, it's going to jump up in Viper Pro. It's going to be the same size as the, the 12 that you're used to if you've used Viper before. So the 10, the 12, and the 16K Viper Pros have the medium size, which is reflective of a 12K that you've seen right now if you've used it before. And then we've got a 20 and a 32 kilogram Viper Pro, and it's going to be the same height, Right, uh, as the 12K that you're used to, but it's going to be uh, an outside diameter that's a little bit larger. So I think 10 and a half inches outside diameter, and that increase of geometry is going to reflect a heavier load, more leverage, uh, much more mass. So you could imagine for those that have ever accommodated a 20K Viper, the largest one we're going to have is a 32K, and that's may not be used that much, but it will be in certain environments, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Where's our lane? What do we stand for? Where are we going to put our time and our attention? That's right. Uh, so yeah, it goes 4, 6, 8, then 10, 12, 16, and then 20 and 32 for three different geometries. Got it. Uh, and the price point for each varies? Yeah, it varies. And that, for any of that, those questions, you know, our uh, website, uh, www.viper.com is the best way to, uh, to get all that information. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, our lane for yeah. the next 18 months, yeah. where we're going to spend most of our time. Because a lot of people have asked me, Michelle, you know, we haven't heard, really heard from you a lot when it comes to Viper. Uh, why not? And it's because of this redesign. And now that we're coming out, what we want to focus on is essentially a couple of, we're going to call it our lane on the freeway. Our lane is going to be special populations, including older adults. It's going to be athletic development from youth all the way to professional sport. Uh, it's going to be first responders, firefighters, police, military. Uh, we're going to do some research things, which I can tell you about, uh, and also the professional personal trainer. And what we want to do more than anything else is engage in a substantive conversation that is uh, meaty in terms of the why. Well, we're not going to we're not going to hearken to some marketing you know jargon. It's really going to be engaging in a community and with thought leaders and yourselves through questioning, etc., that we can really start to identify the why. Because, you know, we often kid that people grab this and uh, they do two bicep curls with it, two shoulder presses with it. And you know, quite honestly, I would too. If I didn't know what to do with this tool, I would probably grab it in, you know, in this realm right here and 
do two bicep curls with it and two shoulder presses, put it back down. I can honestly say that we've got better tools in the gym that, that accomplish that's that right. task. It's a great, you know, uh, great exercise for an outcome. Uh, this is designed for movement-based resistance training, and that introduces the idea of variability. That introduces odd position lifting. That introduces the conversation of starting power and dead starts. That introduces the conversation of activation in multi-dimensional ways. That uh, introduces the conversation around loaded mobility and why we would do that. Uh, that introduces the conversation of hit and hiss style training for high intensity. So all of these things we want to identify with clarity and really focus in on the audiences that I just identified with opinion leaders and thought leaders within each. And I think if we can do that effectively and really engage in a, in a conversation, uh, then we'll, what we'll hopefully do is amplify the value of a style of training that can incorporate this tool. That's right. Yeah. And that, that style of training really is the driving mechanism for a lot of the education that we provided. Right. Uh, the exercise design, the workout design, if we scrutinize movement and we say, how do we enhance movement? What are the training principles behind that? What are the coaching principles behind that? That starts to dictate the, probably the most efficient way we should use this. And, you know, that's why when we first started, we we're like, man, 10,000 exercises at least. If we just sat down for the next week, we'd come up with thousands of exercises. But in a, in a way, it was because this was such a new product for us. We, you know, yeah, there's lots of things that we can do with it. And I think over the last 10 years, we've now really narrowed it down into, like, these are the most effective ways of using Viper, Viper Pro. Uh, to to create the outcomes that people are needing for resiliency. Yeah, and I remember having a conversation with Mark Verstegen from um, Athletes Performance Now Exos, but, you know, boy, he's clever in so many ways, but he said, you know, that, that may be great that you have that infinite amount. Yeah. You know, give me 30 that you go to often. Yeah. Because he knew that at that point he can replicate that and bring it into a larger scheme, which I think is effective uh, in terms of how we organize our thoughts. And if we think about the the multi-dimensionality, i.e. the multi-planar, the, the, the multiple movements that we can do, and then we want to load it, that really drives the purpose for the size creation from 4 to, to 32 now. Before it was just 20. And we've gone up to 32 because we've seen populations probably be able to handle 32. Uh, but there's a reason why it doesn't go high, heavier than 32, and there's a reason why it doesn't go lower than 4. Right. Because, well, for that first one, or for the second one, if you have less than four kilo, is it loaded movement training? Well, yeah, and I think that at that point, what we want to do is have an adaptive process. If we want to load this less, tilting patterns are great for it. Right. Because they, they can drive the motion without really loading the motion. That's right. And when we tilt it, particularly for different populations, uh, we anchor another point of contact into yeah. So I think for those types of actions, we can easily explain how we can unload a 4K to make it even lighter, but actually even authenticate even more the, the idea of um, creating a safe environment for that body to self-organize the task. That's right. And I think that's critically important to understand. Uh, Education is going to be, and programming is going to be a, a big driver for us. And so maybe, you know, DP, you can talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the education that's on the mobile device. And what was the thought process behind the six chapters? Yeah. And what can I expect as I go through that? Sure. Uh, so we have two major uh, education offerings right now. We have the uh, Viper Pro uh, Mobile and Viper Pro Live, uh, Live Workshop, so one-day workshop. And so for the Viper Pro Mobile, we basically created a six-chapter curriculum and that's delivered to your mobile device, whether it's a tablet, whether it's your phone, and it's a very video-rich uh, environment that you're going to see a lot of visual representation of essentially, you know, what is Viper? What's the science behind it? There's, uh, we have relevant research that's linked in there. So if you wanted to go deeper as to the thought process as to uh, why we're driving this movement based approach, uh, we have an exercise library. Uh, we have coaching principles because to train movement is different than training, I'd say muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have, a workout design as well so that way if you wanted to create authentic adaptations with movement towards mobility strength power and metabolic conditioning you're gonna have those at your disposal so that's kind of how we organize the six chapter curriculum to walk you through 
uh, and build confidence around how I can use this effectively with either yourself uh, or with a client of yours. Now, the live workshop is really about creating a, a trustworthy resource that not only has done the mobile education, but went to a live event with like-minded colleagues, with a Viper Pro uh, master trainer that is going to walk you through how to coach this effectively. Because if you know, it's one thing to learn a bunch of things via a book or uh, on the internet. It's another thing to actually go and practice your coaching skills. And it, it's a safe uh, and, and trusted environment to do so where we're allowed to make mistakes as we learn how to move with load uh, and it becomes a really fun event and we basically walk you through how to um, do so for those various adaptations that I mentioned. Yeah, so and I think thank you for that. I think that's it's important for us on the educational front and also the programming front. Um, hey DP, there's some questions floating in. Do you want to answer some of those? We can. Okay, so the first one is, um, is it from Essen here? We've got um, time, time deliveries to Canada. Well, we got off camera, we got Jay here. So uh, for, for delivery to Canada, North American delivery will be all out of the, the, um, the warehouse here in, in the U.S. And, uh, and so I think delivery times would be normal delivery yeah. times. Product will be available mid-May. Product will be available in mid-May. We're, we're taking orders right now, uh, but we'll be fulfilling the delivery in mid-May. Yeah. Okay. So delivery times are depending on modes of, transfer, I mean, modes of shipping. And that can be found on our website, yeah? That's correct. So on our website, guys, for delivery times, uh, when you go through the checkout cart, uh, you'll have actually uh, where you are and then the mode of delivery, if it's air, if it's ground transport, and they'll give you some uh, indication as to some time frame. So I appreciate that question uh, that was written in. Uh, Kat has a great question. Kat, thanks for, thanks for the question. Uh, what are a few movements that the new Viper Pro design allows for that the previous model uh, did? Well, I think the, the previous model, we always have to be careful. That's a great question, Kat, so thanks for, uh, uh, nice to hear from you. Thanks for writing in. Uh, we always have to be very careful about not loading the Viper and it loading us. So the, the narrative was always, it's designed to load us, not for us to load it. When we think about acceleration drills, uh, because of this is just it's so robust, it's, it's just, it's, it's so tough. Uh, we're able to load it into the ground differently. We're able to accelerate it into the ground differently. We're able to load our bodies onto it differently now. Uh, so we can actually, there is a capability for us to actually put our body weight on it. Um, because of the texture strip, uh, we're able to do pinch grips and other accelerative patterns without risk of it, you know, slipping. Yeah, slipping away from us and getting away from us. Uh, the, the ends, which are flared, allow us a lot more of a barrier. So if I'm doing swing patterns, for instance, you guys can see this sometimes. I'm gonna get a sec. If I do a swing pattern right here, get away. <laughs> what I can do is I can anchor my hands on the body of the Viper, we'll say that's on to, but there's a ridge between my hands and the end so that as I accelerate it away, which I'm not gonna do, uh, there is a ridge that catches my hands. So there's a border. No. And so you know that allows uh, me to, to basically do more flowing swing patterns. Same with the flow, if I grab the handle itself and I'm flowing, that handle is not going to flex as much, and the risk of it tearing is, is far removed. So all of those things allow us to be more dynamic with certain athletic populations. Uh, and also for the special populations, the older adult, the falls prevention crew, I can actually load into it. So if I have fear of falling, I'm going to go off camera here, but if I have fear of falling, I can hang on to this. And if I'm on a one and a half leg balance, I can put a little bit more of my load onto this now. Right, because that's loaded into the ground. And if that's the case, it's not going to bend and flex and yield that's to right. my body weight. And that may be important if I'm 75 and I want to train balance, yeah. but I want an additional support of balance that's into right. the ground. That's right. right. So thanks, Kat, for that great question. And these are some of the features that we're going to be enhancing, but it gives you a good idea as to um, you know, why this tool was created with the different features. Yeah. What else we got? Let's see. There's someone on your phone too. Is there? I think so. There's one on my phone there. All right. So from uh, Carolyn. from Carolyn McCoy, thanks for the question. Does the education series have a component of group fitness programming in addition to its use with one-to-one -one training? 
So does our education offer group training within it? So thank you. So the, the base education is going to give you a construct that you can apply to any environment. So for instance, if I'm, let's create a couple of fictitious environments. Let's say I'm at, you know, I'm, I'm at a physical therapy clinic and I'm a physical therapist. I'm going to learn how to use the product, the, the science behind it, this, the, the techniques behind it, such that I can create a right environment of rehabilitation so that I can better accommodate uh, the specific adaptations for a particular individual. Uh, if let's say I'm an SNC coach and I'm looking at first step quickness, right? The first derivative of power is force into the ground. So I need to accommodate force into the ground. I'm going to learn in the educational features what the science is behind this and then how do I create dead stopping scenarios, right? Or dead, in this case, dead starting scenarios for acceleration drills. So I'm going to go completely concentric first from a dead position. And these dead starts are going to accommodate my ability for first step quickness, yeah. right? For whatever sport I'm into. Uh, so the education is going to serve as a platform. And if I'm teaching group classes for calisthenics or, you know, just general conditioning, I'm going to create or at least have the awareness through the education process of how to create the constructs and how to justify them, whatever my environment is, right? right? So if it's general conditioning, I've got a boot camp that's, you know, at two o'clock in sunny San Diego. Um, I can have task-oriented drills yeah. uh, that can be inside and outside equally. And I know how to put them together. I know how to regress and progress them yeah. based on the education. Yeah. And then to accommodate different readiness uh, measures. And then, you know, how to filter them through in a program because chapter six is, is or chapter five, chapter five is yeah. programming, right? So that accommodates different, uh, different patterns. Uh, along that line, yeah. So there's the chapter five, which is all about coaching. We also get into queuing. Uh, and regardless of the environment that you're in, uh, using the right cue and the type of cue will really help set up either the one-on-one -on -one environment or the group environment really well. And we talk about uh, different types of cues, uh, one of them being internal versus external cueing. Right. And if we're always using internal cues when we're doing loaded movement training, we can actually set up the users for, for lack of a better term, failure because they're too internal with trying to do a movement that requires the entire body. They become too mechanistic in their movement, which tends to lock down and create rigidity within their body. And listen, let's be honest, like I've been there too, where I tell people, hey, fire your glutes, brace your core. Those are internal cues that you would use typically in the strength uh, world, you, you know, for training muscles and muscle, uh, uh, muscle resilience, whereas, we would use a lot, especially with the execution of Viper Pro exercise, more external cues, uh, where we're trying to get this concept around this person to be thinking about those concepts right, to be able to execute those movements. Yeah, and it, it brings up a different uh, question as to how does the body self-organize a motor task? Yeah. And a lot of times we think about involving muscle activity, upregulating a motor unit or a series of motor units in an effort to produce an outcome. And while that may be true in a stable environment, it's less true in a dynamic environment. And as we you know, regress and progress our schemes, we have to pay close attention to that because on is slow and off is fast. So I'll go back to the SNC environment for a second. If we think we're gonna develop speed by more conventional strength training approaches, that may be to a certain degree misguided uh, because a muscle turning off quicker is speed. That's right. And so at, we can ask ourselves in the gym scenario and an athletic training scenario, when do we train the muscles to turn off quick? It's typically the opposite. We train them to stay on, turn on and stay on. And we need to kind of rethink these aspects because if speed is our outcome, we need an opportunity for the body to be stable, to recognize stability, and to up and down regulate very quickly. And that is that kind of external cueing organization, yeah. right? If we create a task-specific action, uh, that allows the muscles to up and down regulate. And that's what we do through flows, which are, which are very important. You know? uh, so yeah, Lisa Cornish. Hi, Lisa. Uh, on the online education platform, what is the possibilities for online coaching cue feedback where live training is not an option? Uh, 
But on the yeah, on the on the do we do we have a chapter that addresses queuing on the No, I, I think she's asking if there's so it sounds like you're asking if we can like let's say get together for like one on one like we're coaching I see. via like a Skype or something like that to where you can get feedback from. And I think that's great for the I mean because don't forget one of our mandates is to engage in a conversation. And a conversation needs to be two ways. Yeah. So, you know, I think for the great question that Lisa's asking and others is, you know, we want to be very responsive to the needs of, you know, our, our community so that the community, and I'll talk about community in a second, but uh, if the question is, can we interact and get some guidance that's more specific, yeah. uh, these are where questions can be kind of um, chimed in or, you know, circulated amongst us. We either can Skype call you or we can actually formulate, you know, a live discussion yeah. uh, or, you know, record if we're getting a lot of similar type questions, we record it and we post it. That's right. And then you guys can drill down deeper where you want to go in that whole mind, uh, mandate. But, you know, for us, I think it's very important that we engage in that narrative in a conversation that's two way. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, Lisa, so sending video in to us or Vimeo or whatever it might be, um, that definitely is an option. We have a, a vast group of, of master trainers that are fantastic resources. So um, either, either us or we'd, be, we'd have somebody on our team be able to help you out with that. And, uh, you know, we can discuss more of that on the side if you want, but that's a, that's a great question. We'd be happy to help you out for sure. Right, Kennedy's going. Kennedy, what's up, buddy? I was, just, I was just talking to Kennedy, by the way. Were you? Yeah. Uh, so he's talking about combat fighting, throwing. Can you speak to this for those who might be uh, thinking it? Uh, I can say just from the education side that, uh, our next plan is to get more into strength and conditioning. So our first education piece is really around the fundamentals, like the basics. You have to get these down first before we start thinking deeper. For example, what you're asking for at Kennedy's. So how do we start to help somebody who's a thrower or who's in combat fighting, et cetera? We're going to have a whole education piece for various um, athletes as well as first responders looking and scrutinizing what they need, not only for performance, but also for sustainability and resiliency. Uh, so we'll have that uh, most likely in, in the next couple of years. We'll ha we'll start launching that. And we're going to bring in subject matter experts right. to help with that. Uh, and that's that's one of the keys. I mean, I think that we've got so many friends, uh, so many colleagues that are themselves subject matter experts. Yeah. And to not bring them into this conversation, we would all be you know remiss. I mean, yeah. we, we would all be you know at a loss. Yeah. And so one of the things that we want to do is, is not be the, 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 mess, the only messengers of, of a, a particular message. We want to bring in our friends and our colleagues and engage in a conversation where their expertise begins to come out and shine. Yeah. And I think that we would all be of benefit you know, to that. Well, well uh, yeah. uh, our network, we have people using this uh, at various professional uh, sports, and they're using it. They've been using it for so long now that they develop an expertise of how to take Viper Pro and use it authentically for their population and so we want to bring them in uh, because they have so much to offer and it's exciting because you know it allows everybody to kind of grow and learn about you know what this tool can can right. do for us yeah. yeah do we have another question in there if, if not I'm going to talk about community uh, let's see so how about using so Kennedy's asking how about using the Viper as a tool in combat fighting or more uh, simulating fighting with them uh, right. So using this to actually be striking. Right. Right. Um, a couple thoughts around that. I think that it would depend on what the outcome is. If the outcome is to train a fighter to throw quicker punches, and I'm going to use Viper to throw punches in my training, my only caution there is if I'm using a load uh, and mimicking the same movement pattern, there's enough evidence in the literature to suggest that that might uh, slow the athlete or the individual down. Yeah. So let me take even fighting, but even take a golfer. Yeah. You know, let's say I was to take this and just go through the golf swing with a Viper, and I say, hey, listen, I'm taking Viper Pro. I'm going through a golf swing. I'm going through the 4K Viper Pro. And then you know, let me graduate to the 10K, sure. and then the 20K Viper Pro. At a certain point in time, we'll actually slow the athlete down because what we don't want to do is load the same movement pattern because that slows the individual down. What we want to do is. Uh, use a different motor engram, a different motor task, a different movement, if you will, uh, but a similar uh, line of force. So let's say opposite shoulder to opposite hip for the golfer. Uh, 
right? Or the, or the striker. And we can do that in a number of different ways with Viper Pro. Uh, but we can make it look like a different motor task. Does that make sense? That's right. And so that way you get the best of both worlds. You're not slowing the motor engram down, right? The neurological feed down, but you're stressing the tissues in a like-minded way to create resiliency in that pattern of motion. So that's how we would address kind of speed and power. You wouldn't load the golf swing or the, uh, the strike in the same motor task. You would actually load the same line of stress, but never mimic the task itself. Yeah, uh, you know, just for safety reasons too, uh, you know, strike, you know, striking, you know, other objects or people, I uh, would say no, like it's probably, that's just not, like the, the risk, and reward is too great a risk for the benefit of the reward. I'd rather just put on gloves and throw punches that way. Uh, the goal here would be to, to look at ways in which we can load those particular bodies in ways they don't normally get all the time because we need to add not only the vocabulary to the motor system, but also for the tissues to help them become resilient. We had to actually break a lot of the patterns that they're so used to all the time. Uh, that's the sustainability part. That's the a resiliency part that we want to add to this discussion. So it wouldn't be just about mimicking the same movements within any sport. It's about how do we promote resiliency and you know variability is a very a key component to that. I think Darren's got a question here. You're welcome, Kennedy. <laughs> Darren Jacobson, how are you, buddy? How do you guys plan to make the product more understood in gyms? I think a lot of trainers want to have people coming into the club asking to train with Viper. And to do that means creating a lot more of. Is that a war and peace type of question? Yeah, a lot of awareness and then it just cuts off. So thanks, Aaron, for that. And that, that's a critical question. I think your experience in clubs and, uh, and through the fitness environment makes that question even more pertinent. Um, I think for us, it's a concept, right? Uh, stability balls really were really under, well, they were very much understood when the concept of core training emerged. Uh, foam rollers emerged as relevant and immediate and understood when the concept of self myofascial release came in. Same thing, we can run through the gamut of, of products. I think for us, it's really about understanding the principles and the concepts behind the tool itself and the concepts behind it. So if, for instance, you know, the cliche was, you know, go to the gym and train like a farm kid. Uh, that can almost be very visually and immediately understood. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it adds to the significance and immediacy of this particular product, right? So I think it's part of science, but it's also the, the concepts behind this. And it, you know, we need to make them digestible, uh, but we also need to make the concepts clear. Yeah. And we've done that through the 4Q, I think and through some of the programming uh, that we're gonna bring out, uh, that's gonna add some clarity as to why we would take this tool and why we would use it alongside all the other ones. I think a mistake is to say that a tool is better than another tool because there's so many uh, factors involved that you cannot say that. What we need to, say, to, to suggest is there are different modalities of training that can commingle and uh, what we want to do with this tool is elevate the concepts behind it uh, so we can magnify its utility authentically in a training environment. And that comes with education and programming, really. Yeah, and so that's where I think we, we took that to heart and said, how can we help get the education out there? Because that is going to be a limiting factor. We don't want people to pick this up and just do bicep curls and shoulder presses with it. So we made the education really accessible. Yeah. So if, every, if, if we put your the education on a phone, you didn't have to come to a live workshop. It'd be great if you did because they get the coaching element. But at the very least, get started by having education delivered to your phone. Uh, that'd be the easiest way for the champions of Viper Pro, which are essentially the professionals, uh, getting them to really understand really what it's all about and its place within the gym environment. Uh, that way it is going to be used authentically to get people where they want to be. And for those that are interested, go to viper.com and go under the education button, and then there'll be two. They'll be live and mobile. Under the, under the mobile, it really is the app with, with a bunch of different lessons that are five minutes each, and you just consume them, and there's usually between seven and 15 or 20 uh, lessons within a chapter. There are six chapters, and uh, it's easily consumed. And it's watching your phone for five minutes, doing a quiz or an exam, 
putting your phone away or going right to the next um, lesson. And you can aggregate that over a period of a week, two weeks, three weeks, or a month. And uh, it's an easy way to, to get access to the information. Each of the chapters has a different focus. You know, chapter three, I think, is all about the training principles. Line, That's right. right? Yeah. Uh, chapter four is all about the exercises. And I, there's 100 exercises that you've got immediate access to uh, with regressions and progressions. And so uh, I think for us, the education play is, is key. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's, uh, let's wrap this up with a little discussion on community. So we've had a lot of discussion about community. And I think community, I, I don't know that there's a company out there that, that wouldn't say that community is super valuable. We're really blessed that all of you uh, have not only championed the product, but you've taken the time and the wherewithal to understand Viper's first iteration and hopefully now Viper Pro and understanding what makes this different. Uh, I really am of the belief that community cannot be created. It has to create itself. And if you look at strong communities within the fitness industry, you look at CrossFit, uh, you look at the OCR communities, the obstacle course racing communities, and to a certain degree, what they've done is they've stood for something, right? We stand for, you know, this style of training. We stand for, you know, this, um, this enthusiasm around running. And we, we memorialize it this way and our events have these in them. But really what makes a community a community is what the community does itself. And in biology, there is, uh, there is a concept called emergence, which is biology always self-organizes within an environment. And I believe community is the same way. Community organizes itself from itself. And so all of you as participants within this community, ironically enough, you will create the community of Viper Pro. We, all we can do is say we stand for this, right? And we, we're going to do what we're going to do educationally. Uh, we're going to provide the material that we can. And we're going to stand for an ideal and a principle and a way of being. And I think what makes the community strong is the ideas, uh, it is the culture, it is the uh, attitudes, and it's also the ideas that emerge from that environment, uh, from the community, from you guys uh, itself, that ultimately create strength in the collective. And that creates the culture. So I think that it's super important for us to be very approachable to all of you, uh, to be very aware and to be very, um, you know, reactive in, in the best sense of the word, reactive to you so that you guys, your voices can be heard and your ideas can percolate to the surface. Because if they are, then you're very much tied to the identity of what we're, you know, we're collectively trying to create. So I would invite you to stay connected and bring your ideas, bring your enthusiasm, and bring your own authentic, uh, authentic, uh, and authentic, uh, I thought, <laughs> authentic aspects forward. He's human. Authentic, yeah. So you're you're creating a, uh, authentication to the actual whole process. And if we can do that, uh, then that community itself is going to be very strong, and it's going to be something that you create uh, and help create uh, as we, you know, kind of elevate uh, what we're trying to elevate together. So that's what I'm going to say about you know, community. Awesome, man. So, guys, thank you very much for uh, tuning in with us on our first Viper Pro live feed. Yeah, I appreciate all your, uh, your support and your attention. Uh, if you found value in this, do us a huge favor. Uh, make sure that you, you can share or follow this, uh, this video feed right after we're done here, after we hit the end button. Uh, and this is how we're going to essentially start to galvanize our community here and get more people involved with load movement training and Viper Pro. And we'll, uh, we'll answer more questions on the, the Viper Pro uh, Facebook page. So you, if you guys have any questions, just jot them down there. We'll be, um, you know, we'll be answering them. And uh, through the course of the next couple weeks, we're going to introduce a lot of our team. And I'm sure you know a lot of the names. And uh, we're really thrilled that they're with us. And we're very thankful and blessed that they're with us as well. So uh, make sure you follow us. And uh, if you have any questions, get on to Viper.com. And then uh, just interact with us through our emails or through the social media handles. So thanks a lot. Thanks, a lot. Thanks, a lot. No problem. thanks guys. See you guys. Good work, right. guys. Now we, now we got to – where was off button here? Off button here? No. Here we go, I guess. <laughs>